Hi, welcome to Instrumental Analysis. I'm Vicki Colvin. What we're doing in this lecture is continuing our discussion of the design of spectrophotometers. And in particular, I'll be talking about splitting light. And by what I mean by that is not like splitting a piece of wood. I mean splitting the light into the various frequencies that it must take in order to make the spectrum. Because remember, the spectrum on the x-axis is lots of different wavelengths. So you have to have a way to take white light, many different frequencies, and break it up into much smaller delta wavelength ranges. So before I get into that, I want to go over again the block diagram of spectrophotometers because they're a little bit tricky. So the top view here shows you what we basically drew initially, which is that the filter of the monochromator becoming before the sample, and it can come before or after the sample. But in the bottom two examples, you see very different types of spectrometers because they are double beam spectrometers. Remember the importance of collecting a spectrum that's ratioed against a blank because absorbance is minus log intensity over intensity zero, or power output from the sample divided by whatever went in. So to get what went in, you need to run a path simultaneously at the same time you collect your data, and that will really help lower your noise floors a lot, and also really clean up the quantitative aspects of your data. So most spectrometers are double beam spectrometers, where they simultaneously measure the sample and a blank. That's the middle case. If you don't quite have enough money, you can also have a single beam, but you basically rotate. You'll take some data through your sample. You'll take your data from blank, sample, blank, sample, blank. And that's another option. But be aware that there's a big difference between a double and a single beam spectrometer. And the double beams are going to have much less noise and much more quantitative Beer's Law for figuring out how much material you might have, for example, in a liquid sample. One of the other changes or features or options you might have in a block diagram of a spectrophotometer is whether it's a multi-channel detector. Everything we've been talking about today, you might imagine a white light, which is all frequencies, being broken down into very specific smaller frequencies. But what if you had the ability to put white light through your sample and then at the end disperse all of the colors and simultaneously measure all of them at once? That's what you do with either a diode array or a CCD camera is you digitize and you actually take a photograph of all of the different light that comes through your sample at the same time. It's the difference between scanning or multi-channel. In a scanning spectrometer, you scan the different wavelengths. In the multi-channel, you disperse it and you collect them all at once. So multi-channel detection is, of course, much, much, much faster and in some cases can lead to much better signal collection depending on how much signal to noise you might be dealing with. So in order to understand in either a double beam case or a multi-channel detector case, or sorry, a multi-channel instrument case, how light is getting separated, you have to kind of remember constructive and destructive interference. So over here on the left are two diagrams showing constructive interference of waves. So this is the addition of two waves that have the same phase relationship. So their troughs are at the same place and their valleys are at the same place. And when you do and add those together, you're going to interfere the waves and reinforce each other. If, on the other hand, they're out of sync, when you add those waves together, there'll be destructive interference, and you won't see that particular wave. So in a grating, and what you're seeing here is something called a Michelle grating. So it's basically a surface that has a certain number of grooves designed into it. They're like little tiny mirrors. You can see white light hitting the mirror. But instead of white light just getting reflected out, you'll notice that the red light comes off at a different angle than, let's say, the violet light. And that's because red light at that particular angle is experiencing constructive interference, whereas the purple light at its particular angle is being constructively interfered, and at other angles is destructive. So by putting and reflecting off of these surfaces, you take advantage of the fact that you can see very, very different kinds. So in this shell grating, the white light is hitting, but the red light is constructively interfering at a different angle than the purple light. And as a result, the red light comes off at a different angle than the purple light. It's not saying that the red light isn't reflecting at all angles. It's just constructively interfering at only one of them. So a, a shell grating, or any grating that has this sort of surface with lots of grooves in it, lets you separate light in that way. The grooves per millimeter on the surface govern how spread out that that light's going to be. So if you have a grating with a different number of grooves per millimeter, per millimeter, you can spread light out a lot, so there's a big angular difference between the red and the violet, or you can spread it out just a little, so there's a narrow range, and we're going to see that in a second. 
So if you want to see how the grading is used in the kind of big picture of the spectrometer, I want to show you this before talking about the grading itself. So initially, the light enters the spectrometer through a set of slits. And the slits control the angular deviation of the light. Remember, the light is not all coming in at the same angle. It's coming in at a slightly different set of angles. Well, the wider you open the slit, the wider the set of angles you admit into the system. What that's going to do then is it's going to bounce off of usually a slightly, uh, a slightly focusing mirror onto a grating. And that's really where the action is. As you can see here, the red light's coming off at a different angle than the blue light. It's having, hitting a second mirror that's getting focused onto an exit slit and then to the detector. So both the slits, which kind of set the bandwidth for the number of angles you're dealing with entering your system, as well as the diffraction grading, the number of rules or the grooves per millimeter, both control how spread out this is in light. Now I want to go to a really cool website I found from Prof. O'Haver at the University of Maryland, who's actually simulated gradings, and I think it'll give you a lot of insight into how they work. Let me pull it up. So in this simulation, what he's basically doing is calculating how grading is behaving. Um, I'm not going to talk much about diffraction order, but I will focus on the number of lines per millimeter. So as you increase the number of lines per millimeter, you decrease the spacing between grooves. And of course, as you make the number of lines per millimeter smaller, you make the spacing between the grooves smaller. So here's what happens. So if we do nothing but go to a really, really, really narrow groove spacing, look how spread out this is. The red and the orange are very, very different in angles than the blue. You've really spread out your light. And you've also diminished the number of photons that you're able to detect in a small area. So you give up the amount of light you're measuring, but you get really good spread in your wavelength, which is going to be improving your resolution. So let's go to kind of a moderate choice. So here's kind of middle of the road. And you can see here they're all spread out. Now what's really happening in a spectrometer that's a scanning spectrometer is the detector is sitting right here. So it might be picking up just the red light. But if that's the window, look what happens as I rotate. There's the, I go orange, red, yellow, green, blue. So by rotating the grating, I put different colors of light onto the detector. That's called a scanning spectrophotometer. And that's how a lot of systems work, especially if you want really high resolution. Now, if you don't have that kind of system, and you have a multi-channel, then your detector, you're going to be running at a much narrower groove, a much tighter groove spacing. So you're going to have fewer lines per millimeter and more spacing between them, so the light doesn't get spread out as much. And then your detector takes up this whole range. And you can detect the orange, the red, the green, and the blue all at the same time. Whereas if you're rotating it with a single photo detector, you have to wait in time to collect your data. So that's really the difference. So when you do an, an extra credit question will be actually to calculate the resolution based on the ruling density. And you can see an example of that in your online textbook. But as you can see, if I go to really, really large ruling densities, I can really spread out my light a lot. And that's sometimes what you want to do if you want a really, really high resolution spectrum. But for most optical systems, the peaks are so broad and blobby that actually you're going to be operating with fairly narrow uh, dispersions in order to increase your light gathering power. So I would encourage you, for sure, to go see that website, because I think it's a great one. OK, moving along, a couple of notes about slit width. As I said before, the slit width, which is shown right here and the number one in the spectrometer, controls how many different angles of light enter your spectrometer, how many different angles of white light. So if you have a variety of angles, you're going to kind of smear out. The red and the green will kind of bleed into each other a little bit. So by running a really narrow slit width, you're going to keep that from happening, and you're going to have a high resolution spectrum. The cost of that will be the amount of light entering the system. For most of the detectors we'll talk about, and most of the light sources, you kind of get a relatively large spot size. So your, your slit actually rejects some of the light that's coming out of your sample, because it wants to keep the number of angles hitting the spectrometer really small. Whereas if you open up that slit width, and you let a lot of things come through, well, you're going to have a lot of light, but you're going to lose resolution. So one of the consequences of that, then, is if you were to sort of scan the bandwidth, which is more or less the delta lambda that your monochromator sort of detects for just white light going through the system, whether or not you have a sample in the way, you would, not see, you would see actually a narrowness to what your monochromator is able to do. It's not going to give you just a delta function in frequency. It's going to give you a spread in frequency. And the consequences of that spread are shown here. So this is an absorbance spectrum. And this broad and blobby one was taken with a very, very big slit width. So the peaks are really smeared out because 
you're putting into your system a fairly large, maybe 30 or 50 bandwidth kind of peak, kind of uh, monochromator. As you narrow it up by minimizing your slit widths, you could also do this by changing the number of grooves per millimeter in your grating, although that's a harder thing to do without take the grating out and put it in. A, a slit width you can just change with very simply in most systems. And as you narrow up the slit width, you'll notice these peaks become much more pronounced. And that's because the spectrum you're seeing is no longer limited by the resolution of the spectrophotometer or the monochromator system. Now, another option, you know, the problem with monochromators and scanning them, or if you have a, you know, a multi-channel detector, is it's expensive. So one of the examples in your last case study, you'll find that they just dispense entirely with the concept of monochromator. And instead, they use an infrared detect, they use an infrared source, but they only detect in a very narrow band of frequencies. And they do that by using an interference filter. The basic principles are shown here. And an interference filter, light's hitting it, and there, there's this metallic cavity that you've defined in the middle. And when light gets to that cavity, it kind of bounces back and forth inside of that cavity. And for just the right wavelength, it will get constructively interfered and go on. And for the right wrong set of wavelengths, it gets destructively interfered. So if you put white light into an interference filter, you're only going to get light coming through of a fairly narrow range of frequencies, as shown here over on the left. So an interference filter can be crafted to allow only light of 3.4 microns in, or maybe light of 9.4, which is exactly what they do to detect alcohol in people's breath, is they window. So you're not using a full-blown monochromator, you're not getting the full spectrum, you're just taking two places in the spectrum and asking questions about how big the peaks are at those locations. It's a very different kind of thing. It's not even a spectroscopy, it's just using infrared absorption as a quantitative tool. Finally, I don't think I can end a lecture talking about separating light without at least introducing you to the term Fourier transform and FTIR spectroscopy. If you're going to do IR spectroscopy in a lab, you're going to be doing Fourier transform IR. And the way in which infrared systems break their light up into different frequencies is completely different than the way we do optical systems. You basically build something called a Michelson interferometer in which the light, the white thermal light, is split into two different paths and it comes back together and interferes. And when the two path lengths are just at the right length, certain frequencies of light are going to be more likely to be present than others. And you consistently scan this movable mirror to kind of scan all the different possible frequencies that can fit into these two arms. Anyhow, to make a long story short, you collect your signal as a function of time. And then you Fourier transform that to get your signal as a function of frequency. Those are some big words. I don't have time to define this. Again, the reading in your book, this is chapter 25 in particular, has a great section on Fourier transform IR spectroscopy if you want to read more about it. We don't have a lot of time to go into it, but keep in mind that it doesn't operate with a monochromator. It uses the two arms of an interferometer to define what wavelength of light is interrogating the sample. And then it collects data in the time space. So by changing the speed of the movable mirror, you change the wavelengths that you're using. And that gives you a way to collect the data in a pretty novel fashion that leads to no issues with background light because light that's hitting the detector that isn't part of this time-dependent spectrum is not going to get analyzed. You get better resolution and most critically you get a higher light throughput so your detectors can detect more light. In any case, it's the standard go-to method for most infrared spectroscopy. So I hope in that lecture I've given you some insights insights into some of the more advanced ways of building a spectrometer, both double bead and the multi-channel detection. We've talked about the use of gratings as well as exit slits to control the bandwidth of light that hits the detector, which in effect controls the weight, the resolution of your spectrum in terms of the x-axis. And finally, I've introduced you very, very briefly to Fourier Transform IR. I encourage you to read more about it if you want to learn. Thanks so much and see you next time.